right, we're glad to come here uh, together today to address the topic of relativism. And I want to address in this talk specifically the atheist charge that religion is evil. I'm going to deal with some aspects of what they say here uh, and especially look at the idea that without uh, the existence of God, without God, God's existence, we don't really have a clear understanding at all or really any understanding of objective good or objective evil. So that's the purpose of what we'll look at uh, this morning. Let's start out with a word of prayer and offer this time to the Lord. Lord, thank you for this time where we can come together and go deeper uh, into this issue of truth, uh, where to put on the uh, belt of truth, it says in Scripture, to sustain us. And yet uh, this idea of truth has been undermined in many ways uh, within the culture. And I pray that you might give us clarity uh, in this time. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, this issue of truth has been uh, thrown up in many ways within the culture. Uh, you find, uh, as this idea of truth is eroded, many people think truth is just about the whole issue of uh, feeling. Uh, and we'll look at that as we go on uh, later on. We also have charges that uh, not only is the issue of truth and error, good and evil, uh, up for grabs, but there are the new atheists in particular, Harris, uh, Hitchens, and Dawkins, uh, even go a step further than has normally happened to say that far from uh, there being no evil or good without God, that religion is, is as a matter of fact, evil. That's a radical new charge, and that it would be better if religion were abolished. Well, I want to touch on that charge. I won't try to uh, uh, address it fully in this time, but at least talk a little bit about uh, what they're saying, and then talk about the central way that you can go to the core to answer that, uh, that objection, that religion is evil. Uh, essentially, the atheists have been trying to capitalize on 9-11 and the the terrorist attacks, and in many ways try to paint all religion with the same brush. That you have these terrorists that in the name of religion are able to do great violence. They point back to Christianity with the Crusades, the Inquisition, and the witch trials as also having committed great crimes or atrocities. Uh, it will point to Hindus that uh, do violence uh, towards Muslims and Christians. If you read their books, you read, say, Harris's, Sam Harris's book, The End of Faith. It's a long litany in the beginning uh, of horrific stories that religious people, atrocities that religious people have committed. Same sort of thing in, in Hitchens uh, book, uh, God is Not Great. Again, there, there are many graphic details about uh, what people in the name of religion have done and trying to paint all of religion with the same brush. And thus they argue uh, that it's all of a piece, that religion is evil somehow intrinsically and thus must be eliminated. It would be better if there were no religion. And if they're, athe if they're atheists, then we can, uh, in one of their mottos that they put up on buses recently, uh, that we need to do good for goodness sake, not for God's sake. Somehow we can preserve the good and actually better defend the good from an atheist point of view than from uh, a religious point of view. It's a radical new uh, objection. Uh, I'm going to come back and particularly address this idea that, uh, that atheism has a standard or a basis for the good uh, in just a minute. But uh, perhaps we can just look at their argument for a second. Uh, maybe it's along the lines of the postmodern argument that, that sometimes you hear, and this would be that religion is by its very nature totalitarian. That's what a lot of postmodern people say, that it's uh, totalizing. It tends to impose its values upon people. And totalitarianism is evil, therefore religion is evil. Perhaps that's the line along which they're arguing. In any case, uh, here's what Sam Harris says, that religion is the most potent source 
of human uh, conflict. Uh, Dawkins says most if not all the violent uh, enmities in the world today are due to the divisive force of religion. They argue uh, paradoxically that any good in religion is not due to religious belief but due to humanism, which is rather a, an appalling, striking thing to say. And they also argue any evil, in, e evil in quote, of atheism is not due to atheism but due to religion, which is another bizarre uh, kind of contention. And that's what they try to argue in their books. I'm not going to try to take on those contentions fully. I have done it in a previous series on answering today's atheists that are available on the C.S. Lewis Institute website. Uh, it's uh, talk two on religion is evil where I uh, deal with some of these contentions uh, in more depth. But let me just uh, point out first that it's important that we be able as believers to recognize and address the idea that the church is full of hypocrites because in many ways it's the number one objection uh, to faith that people have, uh, that the church is full of hypocrites. And in some sense, it's important to acknowledge that. Uh, G.K. Chesterton argued that the best argument against Christianity is Christians. Uh, but he also said that the best argument for Christianity is Christians. And often when people make that charge, uh, Christianity uh, is full of hypocrites, or the church is full of hypocrites, that's what I say. I use the quote. I'll say, uh, Chesterton said, uh, the best argument uh, against Christianity is Christians. And they'll immediately shake their head and agree. But then I'll follow up, but the best argument for Christianity is Christians. So you can sit back and pause and think of uh, that just because it's true in some cases doesn't mean it's true uh, in all. Uh, another thing that you can say to this uh, charge that uh, the church is full of hypocrites goes along these lines, that there's a profound difference between being a sinner uh, and being a hypocrite. Uh, all hypocrites are sinners, uh, but not all sinners are hypocrites. Let me talk about that for a second. First of all, all hypocrites are sinners. What, what is a hypocrite? It's someone who claims that they're doing good, but they're actually uh, knowingly doing that which is evil. <clears throat> There's a difference between a hypocrite and a sinner. A sinner admits that they fall short uh, and uh, is sorry and repents for it. Now, now, it's not so much that people within the church uh, are the good people and the people outside are the bad people, although sometimes, unfortunately, that's the impression that's given. Uh, the people uh, in the church, according to Scripture, are those who fall short or sinners who, who need to repent. And so we're not intrinsically any better than anybody else. We've hopefully come to acknowledge our sin and repented of it and come to believe in Christ and now have the Spirit indwelling us so that we can strive to overcome the sin that's within us. But in any case, it's not that we're somehow intrinsically better than other people. The people outside are those people who are also sinners but sometimes don't know it and won't admit it, and haven't come to Jesus for the cure uh, for that particular problem. So uh, there's a difference between a hypocrite and a sinner. Not everybody in the church is a hypocrite. There are some hypocrites. Uh, but everybody in the church is a sinner. But just being a sinner doesn't necessarily mean that you're a hypocrite. So that's an important distinction that you can make if, if you have the time or opportunity. Another level that you can go to. And again, uh, these are things that you could just keep in the back of your mind to, to use where appropriate. Uh, that who's the greatest critic of hypocrisy ever? In fact, where does this charge of hypocrisy and it being wrong come from? I would suggest it comes from one particular person. And who is that? Jesus. <laughs> uh, it's, Jesus is the greatest critic of hypocrisy on record. Uh, look, for instance, in just one case, at Matthew chapter 23. Uh, in that chapter, you have seven different times that Jesus says to the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day, not just the people that were characteristically the tax collectors and the prostitutes and that sort of thing, but to the religious leaders of Jesus' day, he says, Woe to you, 
the prophetic word of judgment, woe to you, you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. And at seven different times he goes through and specifically talks about different forms of hypocrisy that they uh, have committed. He talks about them as dens of vipers, whitewashed tombs, pretty strong words to say the, to the religious leaders. Uh, of Jesus' day. So Jesus was not at all afraid of pointing out hypocrisy in general, and especially religious hypocrisy within the church. I think in many cases, you might be able to say to people, depending on the case that they're dealing with, uh, where there have been noted falls of, say, religious leaders or ministers who have fallen into a gross sin, you might be able to say, Jesus would be on your side in condemning this kind of hypocrisy. Uh, in many ways, you're echoing what Jesus has said in making this charge of hypocrisy. So that's an important thing to understand, that it's uh, Jesus that popularized this critique, and that many, in many cases, Jesus would agree with the, the critiques uh, that non-believers are making about the church. And maybe he would, if he were here in person in the flesh, he'd be making them himself. Uh, another question, though, that's important, and again, you don't have to use all of these, you could just use one, it is the question, is Jesus a hypocrite? That's probably uh, more to the point. Uh, does, is Jesus who he said he is? Does he pretend to be something that he's not? If he claimed to be God, is he God or not? And there's a classic argument that we may look at later in this series, where he's either uh, a legend a uh, lunatic, a liar, or Lord. Uh, or uh, to put it another way, that Jesus, if he's not God, he's not good, is another way to put it uh, in a nutshell. Because he claimed to be God, and if he wasn't God, if he didn't have the kind of authority that he claims to have within the Gospels, then he's not at all someone to follow. All right, so that, that's the question that needs to be sooner or later examined uh, when you deal with this issue of hypocrisy. So just some thoughts about how you can respond to this, and I think it's important to acknowledge uh, where religious people and Christians in, spe in specific have done very bad things, that not only it's sinful things, but sometimes hypocritical uh, things as well. Uh, again, I'm not going to deal with uh, the, some of the different things that, that the church has done in terms of the Crusades, the Inquisition, and the Salem Witch Trials, some other things that they bring up. You can find that on that other website, or even to look at atheist crimes in the way that they try to defend it. Uh, just to let you know that there are, though, uh, a number of different places where you can find the argument made that the foundations of what is good, particularly in Western society, uh, come particularly out of Christianity. There's a whole bunch of books along this line. One of them uh, call, is a book called What's Christianity Ever Done for Us? Uh, another one, uh, Vishal Mangawadi, who's from India, has come over here to the U.S. and done uh, a video series, an audio series, Must the Sun Set on the West. He's also written another book, Vishal Mangawadi, M-A-N-G-A-L-W-A-D-I, uh, has written another book, Truth and Transformation, that's just out, and has another book that come out called The Soul of Western Civilization. And in these books, He's arguing that the foundations of Western culture and what has been really good about our society are really profoundly rooted in the Bible, uh, particularly the idea of dignity, rooted in the idea that people are made in the image of God, the idea of freedom, uh, the idea of uh, many other ideas within our culture uh, have, its, have the roots specifically uh, within, within the Bible. There's another author, Rodney Stark, has written several books uh, really arguing these kinds of things. So that there's an abundance of testimony uh, on the roots, the not only the religious roots, but the specifically Christian roots of our society. And if you were to undermine or pull the rug out from under those roots, uh, much in that society will be eroded. Maybe not right away, because the memory of those values is still there, but over time, those values will, will topple. If you take away the root, you'll, you'll lose, after a while, the fruit. Uh, some other thoughts just about some of the good things that people at Christian, uh, that are Christians have done. Uh, just a very quick 
superficial uh, uh, note. Uh, for instance, there's an abolition of foot binding in China, were done by particularly Christian missionaries, a horrific practice that let, left women's feet disfigured, or the abolition of sati, the burning of the uh, uh, widow on the husband's funeral pyre was also something that believers strongly uh, fought against. The origin of the women's movement, the feminist movement in the U.S., started in a Wesleyan church uh, in New York. Uh, the abolition of slavery was particularly through Wilberforce and people around him uh, in England and in America. It started with the Quakers and then others got on board with it, but there were specifically Christians that led to the abolition of slavery both in England uh, and in the United States. Uh, today, we have people uh, fighting on this whole issue of slavery. Gary Haugen, uh, in International Justice Mission, he says that there's more slavery today than in 400 years in Wilberforce's time. More uh, just general slavery, and specifically sexual slavery as well. That's part of that. And it's very tragic. There's a whole lot yet to be done. Sla the idea of slavery has not been abolished just because we've abolished it in America and in England, generally speaking. There's a whole lot of slavery, and even sometimes in America, we have people that are slaves, sexual slaves, in a hidden way. And I know prosecutors that are going after them uh, from the Justice Department, so I know specifics of things that are going on there. Uh, the, the beginning of hospitals and the importance of health care was something that was a, a Christian institution. Education, all the way back, was, was something that was greatly valued, and the importance of reason, and investigating all aspects of culture, because all truth is God's truth. Augustine used to argue, learn everything you can about anything you can, because, because all truth is God's truth. Every specific truth will take you back to the God of truth. So the education has been highly valued. The great universities have been founded by believers because they valued investigation, and valued knowledge, and valued the whole, of, whole human person, including reason and, and feeling and conscience and, and the will as well. So uh, the whole roots of education, you look at the major universities uh, that are part of America today, uh, say Harvard and Yale and Princeton, all had their roots within a Christian uh, background. If you look at Oxford and Cambridge, uh, look at profoundly their Christian uh, heritage uh, that's been present from the beginning. So uh, Christianity has valued and encouraged education uh, in a profound way. The idea of human dignity and human rights uh, being rooted in the image of God. It's far from clear on what other basis you can assert uh, human rights and give it justification other than people are made in the image of God. It's a question we could pursue uh, a lot and a lot more in a, in a deeper way. But uh, there's often the charge by the new atheists uh, that religion is somehow a mild dementia. It's somehow a kind of insanity, that people that are religious are imbalanced in one way, in one way or another. We, we talked about that earlier where uh, in this series where religion comes from memes or it's a, some kind of virus or a thought contagion the kind of lunacy that's part of it. Uh, contrary to that, I just wanted to mention one uh, study. It's by Harold Koenig, C-K-O-E-N-I-G, and Harvey Cohen. The link between religion and health. Uh, Psychoneuroimmunology in the faith factor. It's Oxford University Press, uh, 2001. Just to give you one illustration of a study that surveys the relation between religion and health. In that book, they survey 100 evidence-based studies. Uh, 79 of these reported at least one positive correlation between religious involvement and well-being. 13 of the studies found no meaningful association between religion and well-being. Seven found mixed or complex association, and only one found negative association between religion and well-being. So if you look at these psychological studies, it's hardly a basis to say that somehow Religion leads to psychological imbalance necessarily. So that's an uh, interesting note that you can pursue further if you wish. Now there are studies out there, and I've heard numerous others uh, talked about uh, by uh, Armand Nikolai, who's a psychiatrist from Harvard, as well as others that have written extensively 
on this subject. Uh, the real problem, though, that I wanted to focus on in this time, rather than dealing with the convoluted arguments that the new atheists use, is to go really to the root of it, uh, to put forward the question, uh, if religion is evil, how do you know anything is evil if you're an atheist? Uh, that's the root question that many people have raised uh, and responded uh, to the new atheists. So that's what I want to look at for the rest of our time here. Uh, that there's a real consequence for denying God's existence, and we'll talk about it right now, as a fixed point. Uh, let me just point out some, some of the great leaders of this civilization have pointed out, including atheists, that you can't have a basis for meaning, dignity, and morals uh, without God. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, who was an atheist existentialist, uh, despaired about the meaning of life uh, without God. And he, he titled one of his books, Nausea, Facing the Difficulty of Life Without God. He said, hell is other people. Uh, Sartre also said, no finite point in this world has any meaning without an infinite reference point. Again, no finite point in this world has any meaning apart from an infinite reference point. Essentially, what Sartre says is that if we judge things with regard to the here and now, with regard to the down here, without this infinite reference point, if no finite point has any meaning, and finite points would be like people, our lives, uh, moral values, truth or error, that kind of thing, but uh, people's dignity, these kinds of questions, if no finite point in this world has any meaning without an infinite reference point, and according to Sartre, there is no infinite reference point, then life is meaningless, which is essentially what Sartre and, and other atheists have said, and I'll give you some more quotes uh, about that in a minute. The only other alternative that you might make is, you could say, life is either meaningless uh, as some of the philosophers, and if you've ever read people from the theater of the absurd, Ionesco and Genet and, and Beckett also made these kinds of claims in the plays or the literature that they've written, that life without God is absurd, like Waiting for Godot is a famous play that uh, puts it forward very graphically and unforgettably. But you have the choice that, uh, that either, that if no finite point in this world is, is meaningful without this infinite reference point, that life is either meaningless or what most people have chosen is not to go with the idea of meaninglessness, but have chosen to construct meaning and dignity and morals on the basis of their own essentially arbitrary personal preference. That's the other alternative. Now, you either uh, say life is meaningless or you can say, I'm just going to make up my own meaning. I'm just going to say people have dignity. That's what the humanist does. I'm going to say that there are morals and make it up in my own way, individually or according to getting together a group of people in the culture uh, and voting about it. We're going to come back to these things in just a minute. But that's the, that's the other alternative, to make up your own meaning according to your own essentially arbitrary personal preference. Essentially arbitrary, meaning there's no higher way that you can judge it. You make, up it, make it up according to your feeling, but your feeling is shaped by your culture, and someone else's feeling, like in another culture, is shaped by their culture, so who's the judge? That's essentially the postmodern kind of argument, but many previous atheists have also understood that idea. It really reduces ethics to personal preference or to uh, emotion. Sometimes it's called emotivism, because it's essentially an ethical statement uh, from a relativist point of view, if you've given up the understanding of God, the uh, ethical statements are re reduced to taking my emotional temperature. So that when I say good, that means I feel something positive about it. When I say bad, it just means I feel something negative about it. But it's essentially reduced to my feelings about something. But we can't judge another person's feeling or another society's feelings about things because it's essentially arbitrary. We can't justify it in any kind of ultimate sense without this infinite reference point. And that's an utterly crucial thing for us to understand. If you understand this idea, I know it's a little bit abstract and a little bit difficult, but if you can understand this uh, statement, you'll understand the ethical dilemma of our time. It comes down to this no finite point uh, is meaningful without the infinite reference point. 
Another famous philosophical founder, Sartre, the founder of existentialism, Wittgenstein, was the founder of logical positivism that's had its fruit today in the postmodern perspective. He said in the Philosophical Review, 1965, the sense of the world must come from outside the world. All right, the sense of the world must come from outside the world. That's similar to this uh, infinite uh, reference point. The sense of the world must come from outside the world. He said if there really was a book of ethics, that really was a book of ethics, it would destroy all the other books in the world because it would give, us, give you real power and a vantage point by which you could see things, really make sense of the world, give you glasses uh, to see it clearly, so to speak. Uh, but he didn't, I understand, give serious uh, consideration to the Bible as such a book, but he realized the value of such a book, if it were to be. Uh, Albert Camus, a fellow existentialist and atheist, uh, along with Sartre, said the only really serious philosophical question in light of atheism is whether or not to commit suicide. And the only really serious philosophical question is whether or not to commit suicide. Bertrand Russell, another famous atheist uh, who lived from uh, 1872 to 1970, said that atheists must build their lives on the basis of unyielding despair. Uh, in many ways, that was the philosopher that uh, shaped C.S. Lewis and some of the environment of his times when he was an atheist. Uh, Jacques Derrida, who's one of the founders of postmodernism, said that one of the central contentions that he's trying to put forward is that he wants to reject uh, what he calls the transcendent signified or signifier. Again, very much something that is, gives us this fixed basis for meaning. He's against, he says, what he calls logocentrism. And by logocentrism, he means meaning or purpose. And uh, the only way he suggests that you can know meaning or purpose is to have a transcendent signified or signifier, this infinite reference point, this sense to the world that comes from outside the world, is the only basis on which we can know meaning. And I suggest also dignity and morals are all involved uh, along with that. So here are some of the leading shapers of our philosophical thought and they all acknowledge these kinds of things. This is something similar to what Pascal argued in his writing. He says, those who lead disorderly lives tell those who are normal that it is they who deviate from nature and think that they're following nature themselves, just as those who are on, on board ship think that the people on shore are moving away. Language is the same everywhere. We need a fixed point to judge it. When everyone is moving towards depravity, no one seems to be moving. But if someone stops, he shows up the others who are rushing on uh, by acting as a fixed point. So again, this is this idea of the infinite reference point or some fixed point that's outside the change and flux of this world. Everything in this world is changing. That's why uh, you, we can't get a sufficient vantage point in this world to be able to make these ultimate judgments. Another shaper of our society, Richard Rorty, who was a fellow uh, postmodern thinker, uh, in his uh, book uh, Trotsky and Wild Orchids, his essay on uh, Trotsky and Wild Orchids, it's an autobiographical essay, says that there's no neutral ground to which a philosophical Nazi and I can repair to argue out our difference. In other words, we might have profound feelings here in America or personally or maybe our community that Nazism is wrong, but the status of that is that it comes out of our emotion and our way of thinking culturally. Uh, there's no way that we can, in some kind of objective way, get up uh, above this flux of things, though, and really judge the Nazi to be evil. They have their own cultural understanding of things, their own preferences, and who are we to judge in the end? Even though we might firmly be convinced and use the language of good and evil, the status of that is essentially it's our cultural standards and, and our feelings that end up determining what's right or wrong. And this is the kind of game that's played a lot uh, within the culture. Now, with regard to human dignity, uh, from an atheist point of view, or according to the new atheists, 
uh, our lives or human people are no, uh, not somehow or another intrinsically more uh, dignified than any other life form in the universe. In fact, some have said uh, a rat is a dog is a pig is a boy. It's essentially uh, all on the same level. That, su that our lives are somehow thrown up by time and chance when we pop out of the cosmic slime by evolution. And if that's the case, our origin is intrinsically zero. Uh, no more than the rocks and chemicals out of which we came. And our destiny is somehow back to the rocks and chemicals. So uh, might use biblical language from dust to dust. Uh, so that our origin is not intrinsically more significant than the materials out of which we came. So what is the basis for dignity? Uh, I would say that it's intrinsically on this basis zero. And occasionally atheists are willing to, to come forward and say that. Like Jean-Paul Sartre said, mankind is a useless passion. A useless passion. B.F. Skinner, the determinist philosopher, said that we need to go beyond such ideas as freedom and dignity. And that's the name of one of his books, Beyond Freedom and Dignity. Because there is no in intrinsic freedom. We're all essentially determined materialistically by our genes or by the, by the environment, whatever. Uh, the idea of freedom is illusory according to the, um, the materialist point of view. And we need to go beyond such ideas as dignity because there is no intrinsic basis for human dignity. And there are others that make this kind of uh, observation. Well, the humanist is an atheist that essentially says that our origin is intrinsically worth zero. We come out of the cosmic slime by evolution. Our destiny is uh, back to that, those rocks and chemicals. There is no life after death. Uh, and yet mankind is a big plus. Uh, there is human dignity, and they would assert human dignity uh, without a belief in God. But where does that come from? I, I think essentially it's asserted because they know that. I believe because they have a conscience, and because they're made in the image of God, they do know that humans have di dignity. But I would suggest that atheists have no basis to say so, really. They're saying that which they know to be true, and it resonates with other people, but there's no basis in atheism to justify uh, the understanding of human dignity. On the other hand, the believer in Christ could say our origin is a great big plus. Uh, and the plus is here, the living God. Uh, God has great worth. He's worthy to be worshipped. That's where uh, our origin comes from. Uh, our destiny is eternal life. C.S. Lewis said, not only that you've uh, never met an ordinary person, uh, but you've never met a mere mortal. That the people you're sitting next to right now are going to live forever either under salvation or under judgment. He says, nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, what are they? They are to our life as the life of a gnat. Now, so the longest civilization might be 1,000, 2,000 years. The longest political reign might be for a number of years. The longest presidency, say, in the United States would be four years or eight years. But what is that uh, to our life That's a, a, as the life of a gnat? So, that there's a tremendous value, particularly in Western culture, because of the Christian heritage of individual life. In many other cultures that don't have this foundation, uh, individuals are expendable for the good of the community. It's more viewed in a communitarian way than a, an individual rights uh, framework. So that the Christian would come back and say, people are made in the image of God, and therefore they have a great worth and value. Essentially, the uh, atheist uh, says in this first line that life is a merely unnecessary chance interruption in the midst of cosmic death. On the other hand, the believer in Christ says that death here is just a very temporary interruption in the midst of cosmic life. See, see how radically different <laughs> these worldviews are by contrast? Uh, it's amazing in terms of its difference with regard to human dignity. And in the area of morals, uh, Dostoevsky had one of his characters say, if there is no God, everything is permitted. And it's hard to resist that if you look at it from 
even several different angles uh, philosophically. Uh, I think that in the end, you only have three options. You have the option that is says me, or says us, or says God. Uh, when you deal with this issue of ethics, it, uh, one way you can go is to say says me. And that's often what you hear in this, this culture. Uh, that whatever is true for you or good for you is good for you. And whatever is true for me is true for me. But who's to judge? Who's good? Like whose justice and whose morality shall we pick? Sooner or later, it's just uh, your feeling versus my feeling. And wh who am I to say that because I'm right, because it's my feeling? So says me, then becomes uh, the statement. I, everyone, in a sense, is a godlet that can create their own ethic according to what they feel. And then who is to impose some external standard upon them and say that it's right? That's where many people are. Uh, a second way you can go is say, says us. Uh, that we somehow uh, get together a group of us within the culture and uh, when this group comes together and decides that something's right for them as a group, then it's right. Not because it's somehow judged by this infinite reference point or uh, objectively right, but just because they've come to decide that it's right. And then if you get enough people, they can uh, uh, put forward laws or put forward candidates, get enough people to vote, and then they can shape the laws in their own way. So it's essentially uh, uh, that might makes right, that the, the majority ends up determining what's right or wrong for that particular society or, or what values that they think are good for the society to have. Richard Dawkins in his book, The God Delusion, says that uh, we could put together what's called the social contract, uh, that we can decide what's good for society. And, and then the greatest number of people get to determine what's good for society. We could shape it according to various ideas. For instance, Kant, Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, had what he called the categorical imperative, which is to will that which, we, you, would, to will that which we, you would make a universal rule. Uh, a second related idea, he said, is treat people as ends, not means. And so these are things that he put forward as a, principles that we could once accepted. Uh, we could use to shape a society. And so uh, Dawkins, for instance, puts that forward as many others have done. There's a guy, John Rawls, who has a book, Theory of Justice. He taught for a number of years up at Harvard. And he basically argued that something like that, that we can get people in society to somehow or another get behind a veil of ignorance, to try as much as possible to do away with our own bias coming from our own group and try to think about that which is fair for, uh, for the society uh, itself. Uh, and the, in that way, we could construct an ethic uh, without God. Uh, however, uh, I think that each one of these issues, uh, don't ha each one of these ways of approaching things, uh, fall victim to what I would call the grand says who. That sooner or later, they have no basis to justify the decisions that, that the majority makes about what's good for the society. In fact, Dawkins, in the end, in The God Delusion, admits that if you want an objective intrinsic good or evil, you have to go to theism or Christianity in order to have it. But you can kind of try to construct this idea of an ethic without God uh, based upon cultural standards. Well, I want to spend some time here uh, trying to address that. Uh, C.S. Lewis says that the reason why you can't do that is intrinsic and philosophical. Now, this is a little bit tricky and difficult, so you may have to think about it a little bit later on, but I'll put it forward for you for your consideration. And the, re uh, the reason it will never work and can never work is because of this principle. Because you can't get ought uh, from is. You can't get ought from is. Uh, here's what he says. From propositions about fact alone, no practical conclusion can ever be drawn. This will preserve society, that kind of statement, this will preserve society, cannot lead to do this, to the imperative, do this, except by the mediation of this idea. Society ought to be preserved. Uh, the statement, this will cost you your life, 
cannot lead directly to do not do this, the ethical imperative. It can only lead to it through a felt desire or an acknowledged duty of self-preservation. The innovator, or in this case the relativist, the one that's trying to construct uh, an ethic without God, is trying to get a conclusion in the imperative mood out of premises in the indicative mood. And though he continues trying to all eternity, he cannot succeed, for such a thing is impossible. And I, I would argue that it is impossible. I'm just putting it forward to you, but it's a basic, an intrinsic basis why this thing can and will never work. You can't get the imperative from the indicative. Uh, you can't get do this from the fact that uh, society uh, will be preserved by putting forward these laws. You can't get ought uh, from is. Uh, you could, for instance, say that uh, you, you could, for instance, say that uh, we could outlaw murder, and that would preserve society. So that that seems to be understandable. So we could make up laws that you shouldn't murder. But is murder intrinsically evil? Well, not in this basis, only because the majority says so. And the question is, what do you say to those people who say society ought not to be preserved? Like a terrorist who wants to destroy this society. What can you say? Can you say that the terrorist acts are evil? Not really. Not, you can say it from the point of view of my feeling or point of view of the majority will, but not somehow that it's intrinsically evil. All you can say in the end is, says us. We in the majority say that murder is wrong and destroying, trying to destroy society is wrong. So if you try to destroy society, if you try to murder, we'll put you in jail. Might makes right. The majority decides what's wrong, and we have the might and power of the law on our side, and we will punish anybody who tries to resist what the majority has to say. If the majority somehow uh, inexplicably started to argue that murder was right, it would be right. Because there's no inalienable life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's essentially alienable. It's determined by the uh, will of the majority in the particular society. That's the problem. And uh, another way to put this is perhaps a little bit less philosophical, but still it's going to be fairly high level, so hold on. Uh, the reason that this uh, cultural move will not work is what one author, interestingly an atheist author, uh, Arthur Leff, calls the grand says who. Uh, he, uh, Arthur Leff, L-E-F-F, -F, was an atheist. And he gave a speech that became an article in the Duke Law Journal in 1979 called Unspeakable Ethics, Unnatural Law. And this essay has been picked up as something of a classic in legal studies because he defined very well that the difficulty, in fact impossibility, of coming up with a, an ethic without God. And it's interesting to come from an atheist who makes this kind of argument. Here's what he says at the beginning of the essay. He says, I want to believe, and so do you, in a complete, transcendent, and imminent set of propositions about right and wrong. Findable rules that authoritatively, unambiguously, direct us how to live righteously. I also want to believe, and so do you, in no such thing, but rather that we're wholly free not only to choose for ourselves what we ought to do, but to decide for ourselves individually and as, and as a species what we ought to be. What we want, heaven help us, is simultaneously to be perfectly ruled and perfectly free. That is, at the same time, to discover the right and the good and to create, and to create it. He says a little bit later, my plan for this article then is as follows. I shall try to prove to your satisfaction that there cannot be any normative system ultimately, ultimately based on anything except human will. Uh, and in essence, he wants to provide the answer to the grand says who. And there are these three answers, says me, says us, and says God. Uh, he says that we, in order to find uh, any kind of normative proposition or any kind of moral judgment, to say that anything's really good or really evil, uh, you must find uh, a moral standard or, or a normative proposition, he says, that's unchallengeable. Uh, when, he said, would it be wrong to violate the command, thou shalt not commit adultery? 
In other words, who has the power uh, to say that in a way that's unchallengeable? Uh, or to put it another way, when, it, when would it be impermissible to use the schoolyard or bar, a bar room trump card says who? You know, in a discussion, you'll, you'll put forward a moral value, and the person says, who are you to impose your values upon me? What, he says, when would it be inappropriate, inappropriate to use this challenge says who? The only time, he says, where it would be inappropriate is if you had an evaluator above being, being evaluated. One who can say, thou shalt not commit adultery, but somehow can, has the power to make that. It's unchallengeable. Uh, this evaluator must be, he says, the unjudged judge, the unruled legislator, the premise maker who rests on no premises, the uncreated creator of values. Now, what would you call such a thing if it existed? You would call it him with a capital H. A God-grounded system, he says, coming from an atheist again, has no analogs. If God does not exist, no one can take his place. He says anything that took his place would be him. What statement can withstand the cosmic says who? He says there's no circumstances, there's no one like the Lord. If he does not exist, there's no metaphoric equivalent, no person, no combination of people like the cultural move, no document, however hallowed by time like the Constitution, no process, no premise, nothing is equivalent to an actual God in this central function is the unexaminable examiner of good and evil. The so-called death of God turns out not to have just been his funeral, but it also seems to have affected the total elimination of any coherent or even more than momentarily convincing ethical or legal system. And there are only two responses to this. Uh, if this, if this moral values are not in God, then the moral values are in us. One of us, some of us, or all of us, but in us. They got those two, two choices. And the response would be, uh, for the atheist, uh, oh, we're free of God. Or the other response is, oh, God, we're free. Each person becomes, as I mentioned, a godlet. But who decides between them, either the persons or groups that, are be, that become a godlet? Uh, who decides between them if there's a conflict? What are the rules that govern, so to speak, interdivinity transactions? But you can't defend the rules on the basis of the godlet preference. You can't say that I'm my own godlet and therefore I'm right, or this group is their own godlet, therefore they're right. Now, there's no intrinsic basis on which you can do that. But might there be a way out? Uh, for instance, could we count the noses or the, the quantity or quality of these ethical boxes that people put themselves in? Like, uh, we could do it with respect to quantity, but just the fact that, you know, a million or five million or ten million people think something's right doesn't necessarily make it intrinsically right. Doesn't make anything intrinsically right or wrong. Or we could choose to go with the quality of standards uh, by which we judge. But on what standard then can we judge what's good or bad or better or best? This second route, is the qualitative uh, route, is the way that most people have taken. They realize that the quantitative is not uh, good enough. Uh, so many people come up with what they call the considered view or the serious and reflective view or what I mentioned earlier, Rawls' veil of ignorance. But who says who's more considered or who's more serious and reflective? Or who is properly doing away with their bias? Uh, this basic belief as to whether you've achieved that goal in each of these cases must be considered good by someone. And you could always challenge it by the grand says who, either to the individual or to the group. Essentially what Arthur Left says is there's no such thing as an unchallengeable uh, evaluative system. There's no way to prove one ethical system superior to any other unless at some point an evaluator is asserted to have a final, uh, a final uh, uncontra uh, uncontradictable, unexaminable word. The choice of that unjudged judge, whoever's given that role, is itself, strictly speaking, arbitrary, unless, of course, he admits, uh, if God says. 
Uh, for instance, there are, some in, there are some books that he mentions that try to do this. One author, Robert Nosick, has a book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And he puts forward this as the fundamental principle of his ethic. Individuals have rights, and there are things no person or no group may do to them. So you could probably get a lot of people to come around that idea. Individuals have rights, and there are things no person or group may do to them without violating their rights. So you could gain a considerable following, maybe millions of people to come around that particular idea. But the question is, if challenge with a grand says who, what makes that principle right? Just because you get a lot of people around, it doesn't necessarily mean it's intrinsically right or the opposite is wrong. Who decides, too, when people with equal rights differ about what's to be done? Or another author, Richard Posner, he, uh, that Leff uses a, as an illustration. He puts forward the principle in his book, no, no person may dominate another. Now, that's a good principle. You get a lot of people uh, to organize around that particular group of people that believe in that kind of thing. Uh, but as Left points out, there are, uh, when two people make a deal with each other, that's a good thing about who's to be dominated and, and not. But what if one person says, no deal? What do you, what do you say to them? The only final answer in the end to that question is, says who? Who's to say? Who's to make up the rules? Who's to even make a rule that seems reasonable to a large group of people? Uh, and essentially, what Left says in his final quote at the end of the article, again, remember, this is an atheist, it says, all I can say is this, it looks as if we're all we have. Given what we know about ourselves and each other, this is an extraordinarily unappetizing prospect. Neither reason nor love nor even terror seems to work to make us good. Worse than that, there's no reason why anything should. Only if ethics were unspeakable by us, not just created by our own words or feelings, could law be unnatural, somehow outside of nature, uh, and therefore unchallengeable. As things stand now, everything is up for grabs. Napalming babies is bad. Starving the poor is wicked. Buying and selling each other is depraved. Those who stood up and died resisting Hitler, Stalin, Amin, Pol Pot, and General Custer too have earned salvation. Those who acquiesce deserve to be damned. There is in the world such a thing as evil. All together now, says who? God help us. That's where this atheist ends up. What I argue in the end in the, my book, True Truth, is this. It's a, sort of the final chapter before the, the summary conclusion. Unless God exists, there's no objective evil or good. There is objective evil and good. Therefore, God exists. You can turn that around and say, not only does the atheist uh, not able to make that claim, but in, in a way, it's an argument for God's existence. You can read the book True Truth to um, see that argument made. One final con concluding remark is that if religion were to be abolished as the new atheists wish, would that make the world better? G.K. Chesterton has made the statement, when man ceases, ceases to believe in God, he doesn't believe in nothing, he believes in anything. For instance, there was a study by Rodney Stark and William Bainbridge of 1,500 students at the University of Washington in 1979. And they found that, uh, that people that don't believe in God are much more likely to accept the newest superstition. Uh, it reveals that born-agains are much, much less likely than other students to accept radical cults and pseudoscientific beliefs. And that it reveals that groups with no religious affiliations are receptive to these unscientific notions. On three of the seven items, in fact, those with no religion are the most favorable towards occultism. Those who, who hope, he says, or what they say, those who hope that a decline in traditional religion uh, would inaugurate a new age of reason ought to think again. Apparently, when Christianity loses its grip on a large number of people, deviant religious alternatives arise and get hold of some of the unchurched. They say, persons with no religious affiliation are often among the first to toy with novel or exotic supernatural notions and are not the secular rationalists we might think them to be. Therefore, a further decline in the influence of conventional religion 
may not inaugurate uh, a scientific age of reason, but might instead open the floodgates for a bizarre new age of superstition. This was in a book on, uh, in a magazine written uh, to atheists or skeptics. So it was a very profound observation. Well, we'll stop at this point, and uh, the next lecture will be on uh, C.S. Lewis' Abolition of Man.